speaking section will be Gaspar Tamash, uh, well known as one of Hungary's foremost dissident philosophers, uh, an <coughs> ex-MP, write, a writer of uh, many books on Europe and European philosophy, and uh, a regular commentator on different developments of the, of, the, of the right in Hungary and elsewhere in Europe. Well, I, I have to talk about many things here, so I'll, so I'll just give you a few points about various things because I cannot possibly leave this room before having told you something about what the hell is happening in Eastern Europe. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, but of course there are a, a number of points, uh, more or less theoretical points that I, I'd like to raise. Fifteen years ago I published an essay in Boston Review called On Post-Fascism in which I tried, well, it was 15 years ago, and I don't agree with, any, with everything in it, but I tried to show how some very important categorical characteristics of fascism can be repeated uh, under more or less or seemingly democratic circumstances. And this, and this of course, means that I have to point uh, those features of fascism. Right, okay, I'll hold it. Uh, uh, those features of fascism that can survive those specific conditions in which historical fascism was born. For example, uh, when you talked about the breakdown of civility, because there is a very simple sociological fact that explains part of that. <coughs> namely that most people in the fascist movements have been just freshly demobilized war veterans. They were soldiers, <coughs> people who knew how to handle a gun and you, who have just left the absolute hell of the First World War. Uh, even the paramilitary organizations of the German Communist Party, Rotfront, was Roter Frontkämpferbund, that means the Veterans Red Association, and so was the Social Democratic uh, Reichsbanner Schwarzwald Gold and the Conservative Stahlhelm, who were all organizations of veterans who were indeed in the habit of solving their problems with guns. And so I could go on, but I won't. The differences are numerous. I would uh, emphasize here, and as I did in that essay, one point, namely what is breaking down in situations that produce fascism is the generalized belief in the universality of citizenship. In bourgeois states of whatever nature, and this has been inherited by the kind of state capitalism called socialism in various uh, places, where the uh, um, most important political idea was that citizenship, i.e. political participation of one kind or another, is a right of every person who uh, can be found within a given territory governed by a well-ordered state. Which means that the state declared itself neutral <coughs> in regard of the worth of persons. In the olden times, as you know, virtue, in the Aristotelian sense, excellence, pertained only, and it was openly affirmed, only to some kinds of people, especially people of blue blood, you know, the nobles, not the ignobles. You know? The few, the happy few, the excellent, the, the great and the good, and so on, the magnanimous. Uh, you know, as opposed to people common as muck. And, you know, those aristocratic societies of various kinds uh, have always believed in the intrinsic inequality of human worth, and in which one of the aims of the polity has been to get the most excellent people at the top. And so people of reason and of magnanimity and of courage should lead the rest. Now, modern states, at least uh, rhetorically and ideologically and legally and whatever, 
are, although they have to face the competitive and agonistic nature of capitalism, but are trying to divide the competition that goes on in, in the economy, which is in all capitalisms is considered to belong to the private sphere, civil society, not the state, right? But the idea is <coughs> that citizens, Kuwait citizens, are equal, and therefore the <coughs> political view of humanity is universalistic. And that was in the 19th century considered to be uh, the aim of progress and so on and so forth, universal franchise, and to racism and to discrimination against women. We are still fighting to get that. You know, that's, that's in the aims of bourgeois democracy, still very far from being realized. I think that capitalism will end before the aims of bourgeois society will be realized. <laughs> <coughs> and, uh, and fascism was as indeed it had to oppose after the First World War communist revolutions that radicalized this idea of human universality and intrinsic and, and the quality of intrinsic worth of human persons and uh, a, a rejection of those institutions and those ideas that would contradict it. Uh, fascism openly declared this to be false. And within a given polity, through various ways and uh, according to various definitions, uh, the equality of citizens, the political equality and legal equality of citizens was discontinued. And in, there's one thing in which I agree with a conservative, sometimes quasi-fascist German historian, and sometimes quasi-Bolshevik German historian, Ernst Nolte, who, uh, in his earlier, early works, has said, and I agree with him, that uh, fascism and Nazism was a reaction to the social revolution. I think this to have been true. And uh, it is indeed the, the world historical opponent of fascism has been not the Weberian bureaucratic state and French or British style parliamentary democracy, but <coughs> communism. Uh, I, I would advise everybody to take the speeches of Hitler and Goebbels more seriously. And uh, so you see, <coughs> in a world in which there has been an alternative, at least a promise for an alternative to capitalism, there is a movement that is destroying the egalitarian and libertarian features of capitalism in order to save it. The enemy is communism, it's not capitalism. Now, so therefore, if we consider the contemporary, contemporary uh, extreme right, the hard right, you have to concentrate on the absence of socialism as an historical movement and as a political reality. Whatever you may think about the Soviet system, and I spent about 20 years in proving that I was not extremely fond of it, <laughs> and this has been recognized by the leaders of the Communist Party with various measures against my modest person, not too bad actually. People had harder times than I had. Uh, so, whatever you think, the Soviet, so Soviet and Chinese communism, at least symbolically and also in many ways in its political practice, has upheld the idea that the alternative to capitalism was not only an idea and was not only a wish, it was not only a theory, a critical theory, but it was a matter of practical politics. It was also therefore dependent on people's activity and people's will, in other words, on people's morality. Now, since this situation doesn't exist any longer, since the world doesn't seem to consist of two alternative somethings, however symbolically, however much the leaders of the communist bloc have 
of course, disappointed all the believers. How much the hearts of millions of communists have been broken. We all know that, of course, still. Uh, the world was not one. So now, when we experience very similar uh, ideas in the far right, you know, from racism, from hatred <laughs> of democracy, a lack of civility, from uh, a, a deep desire of rejuvenation, regeneration of uh, obsolete and rotten and corrupt and uh, impotent states and so on. Of course, there are many parallels, obviously. But one parallel which is, I think is crucial is lacking. It may be a preventive counter-revolution. It may be a counter-revolution that tries to fob off a new wave of rebellions against capitalism. But this would be only a, 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 a hypothesis with very little uh, <coughs> uh, foundation, in fact. Uh, that such preventive functions of the fascist counter-revolution in the 20s and 30s existed. And uh, especially in Germany. But this is not like that. Bourgeois or socialist universalism, the ideas inherited from the Enlightenment and the increased uh, collective effort towards greater equality in various respects is not a fundamental fact of our political lives. This is why contemporary far-right and contemporary fascism and post-fascism and what have you are so strikingly and worryingly similar to mainstream conservative forces and vice versa. Uh, one of the most conspicuous features, like before, of contemporary far-right is, of course, its strong anti-egalitarian dynamism against the equality of people of other races and ethnies, against women, homosexuals, foreigners, immigrants, various allogenous groups. And uh, so there's a dynamic in which, in which, again, groups that for a <coughs> universalist Democrat would have appeared as a group of fellow citizens, whose problems should be solved in democratic political ways, these groups again appear as enemies, as intractable, as irreducible to a common democratic and rational discourse. You know, of course, all that. Just open every morning your newspaper. And, and this discourse of uh, refusing uh, groups of people on cultural, racial, ethnic, linguistic, denominational, traditional, gender, etc. grounds is also the discourse of mainstream conservative parties, of right-wing parties in many places of the world. So there's a dynamic in which there's a confluence of the far, traditional far right and their uh, uh, hitters and bandits <coughs> and paramilitaries and, res and respectful and respectable uh, uh, mainstream forces, including nowadays such forces as the French Socialist Party. And, uh, you know, as traditional a French Socialist Party you've ever seen, uh, to the right of Charles de Gaulle. And, uh, and this situation also shows that how soft contemporary the, the contemporary bourgeois state had become. Uh, it can be punctured, cut into pieces, and its constitutional grounds doubted and trampled underfoot in the most open manner in various, in various countries, in most countries actually. And here, therefore, the far right uh, functions as a goading force, as an impulse, as a triggering uh, factor that transforms the whole society <coughs> and which channels the anti-system and anti-regime energies that are accumulating because of the crisis 
and because of the total lack of perspectives and alternatives in contemporary capitalist society. <coughs> this is why the rebellious and dissatisfied and radical youth is being more and more shanked by the far right from its natural place on the left. And uh, just to, to give you the most recent example of uh, Hungarian history, not a week old uh, piece, you know, after a wave of demonstrations organized by the opposition to the uh, chauvinist and far-right government of Mr. Orban, uh, Mr. Orban, uh, then, uh, uh, you know, the latest opinion polls came out, which showed that this open dissatisfaction with the regime had only one party, the open fascists, who are now the second largest party in, in the country, uh, only a little weaker than the governing party, and uh, doubly as strong as the main democratic opposition party, the socialist party. So together, together, the two kinds of, uh, of right are an absolute majority. And <clears throat> which shows again that those demonstrations protesting social injustice, corruption, and uh, servility vis-à-vis -vis the great powers, uh, have made people to believe that these slogans are reconcilable with the political practice and basic aims of an openly fascist party. Now, this is maybe an extreme case and I wouldn't deny that Hungary is one of the worst places politically, otherwise it's delightful. But, okay, to a certain extent, every now and then, you know, sometimes I'm reminded of it, especially when foreign friends come to visit and they tell me how nice Budapest is, and they say, oh, we are quite, yeah. Uh, but, but this is, but this is uh, not only a Hungarian, not only an East European question. The fact that there is no opposition to the system on the left means that the whole system is very vulnerable. Just think how did capitalism live before. Capitalism was opposed from the left by the revolutionary workers' movement and on the right by the alliance of the throne and the altar. You know, old aristocracy. The, dynasties, established churches, etc. So the classical conservative forces. Neither exists. The democratic struggles in the 19th century Europe were of the bourgeoisie and, 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 and of others, its allies, have been against the aristocracy and the monarchy and the army and the church and so on and so forth, and of course against the incipient socialist movements. Neither force of the past, of the aristocratic past, and of the, of the socialist movements exists. And this, surprisingly, the early, there is early capitalism on the horizon. Capitalism for the first time, that's new. It's the first time in history that capitalism fills the whole political horizon. This was never the case. There was a strong systemic opposition from the right and from the left. Well, this is not the case any longer. And, cap and this hasn't solved capitalism's problems. It has crisis ridden, unjust and, and erratic as it always was. And so the energies within it that are uh, aiming at an opposition, at a rebellion, at a criticism and so on, are aiming against what people perceive to be the basic tenets of a bourgeois liberal democracy and they reflect a deep lack of faith, deep lack of confidence in these basic tenets. Liberty, equality, fraternity, constitution, division of powers, what have you, civil society, what have you. Therefore, <clears throat> winning over the rebellious youth and other rebellious groups with the old enlightenment and bourgeois democratic uh, discourse of liberty and equality is 
hopeless. It's hopeless. This is indeed identified with the contemporary social world as it is, which is neither uh, nor free, uh, neither free nor equal. <coughs> but what is worse, this, these movements are very deeply anti-political. The ways in which political persuasion, as you said, political persuasion, deliberation, discussion are taking place, are seen by people deeply dissatisfied with the mendacity and nullity of it all, by believing more and more in the rejuvenating and regenerating energies of violence, and of a total turning their backs on the usual procedures in which things are decided in capitalist societies. See, so, there are two sides of the same coin, and a politicism, seeming indifference and lack of interest for public affairs, for the common good, for the public interest, and so on and so forth. People are just turning their backs because they don't believe in it. They think it's all lies, right? And they have a point. And, uh, and the other, on the other side of this coin is that if this is so mendacious and, the, and, and life is so terrible under the reign of the system, then it does not deserve our consideration and stability is not worth anything in a peace or any kind of peace. So we are on the brink of the takeover of a generation for whom the usual bourgeois values and virtues of peace and order and calm and consumption and, uh, you know, rising living standards and um, understanding and compromise and gradualism and so on are just contemptible. Contemptible. And so, you know, I am uh, often talking to young audiences, at least in Europe, in various countries. Well, of course, I mostly meet, of course, leftish people, but not always. And it is very interesting how much what I say of a revolutionary nature echoes with the right. I wrote an article saluting uh, the victor of Syriza and Greek elections. Next day, the far right newspaper saluted my article in hymnical accents on the front page in Hungary. Yeah. The series I supported in the East European press by the fascists mostly. And they won't, it won't even cross their minds that an other rebellion than theirs is possible. It is construed by this, by this press, internet and paper-based press, it is, that it's a, it's, it's a fight against the West. It's fight against bourgeois democracy. It's fight against the pieties of the much hated European Union, the most hated institution that I've ever come across. The Communist Party was never so hated. <laughs> <laughs> Not one single day. And uh, to my surprise, I must say. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, when, when Alexis Tsipras is fighting the dragon of the European Union, he has the sympathy of the nationalists right everywhere in Eastern Europe. Because, of course, it's also combined with victimhood, you know, great traditions of mistrusting the West and so on and so forth. There are no anti-Russian feelings. No. no. How do you don't encounter anti-Russian feelings, except where there are some historical places like in Poland, <coughs> in the Czech Republic, <coughs> and I've never come across anybody who's anti-Russian. But I know thousands of people who are anti-American. Yeah. Hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah, it's the most popular thing you can say, that you are anti-American. Mm -hmm. This is after 25 years of Western-style democracy and membership in the EU and the... Uh, I, I almost said Warsaw Pact, but no, maybe. <laughs> that's what I'm left in. So, so, you see... What you have as fascism today is very fairly distributed among people. It is not 
uh, movement <coughs> with very hard contours. It is a mood and a way of looking at things and also a way of doing things that is picked up by one group after another and it doesn't have the dictatorial, totalitarian, uh, <coughs> very, very strong disciplinary unity and organizational unity of the erstwhile fascist parties. Not at all. Fascism has become something pretty general. And at the same time, of course, weakened because it because of course it's not constructive a new regime or whatever, it's not, not constructing a new national world order. So therefore, when uh, you are analyzing and regarding fascism in various countries, you should always take into account that the parties you hear about as extreme right parties are just a spearhead of a change that is much larger, much more momentous. And take France. What is the real difference between Front National and UMP? Apart from style, culture, you know, they, they you know they, they have a, of course a different different tradition of swing that coming from different parts of the old French political landscape. So the you know the old collabo Grand <coughs> Bourgeois doesn't look exactly like the desperate uh, lower middle class or working class uh, uh, militant of the National Front. But basically, the political platform is almost undistinguishable. And people say there's a great fascist danger in France. But they already have the majority. They already have the majority. And look at the reactions of the French state after these terrible bombings that happened in Paris. And so, you know, uh, so, so this is in a way analytically more difficult to pinpoint. But this has become one aspect of a general political decadence. I'm finished. And so, so are many other things. <laughs> <laughs> Not only my speech. <laughs> Thank you.